what I want to talk about today was the development of macroeconomic ideas, which we uh, sort of learned the basics of last time. Uh, and there are business cycle theories going back to the 19th century, but I'll, I'll spare you the details of those. The sort of modern debate begins with the Great Depression. And the Great Depression, of course, follows the Roaring Twenties. There's a big crash in 1929. And one of the people who had done really well during the Roaring Twenties was an economist named Irving Fisher. The picture in the corner is a Rolodex, which Fisher invented. And he sold the company that he had created to produce them. That gave him a small fortune. He went to the stock market and made a big fortune out of it. He was worth something like $100 million in today's terms. And he became known as a stock prognosticator. And he was invited to a dinner meeting in New York City uh, in October 1929, <coughs> excuse me, where he made this forecast that stock prices have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. Uh, there was another speaker at that event, an investor named Roger Babson. And Babson said the stock market's about to turn down dramatically. And Fisher says, oh, nonsense. Uh, although it may be at its peak now, I don't think there will be a 50 to 60 point break. Well, of course, there was a much bigger break in a couple of weeks. And Fisher had been putting his money where his mouth was. He had been borrowing heavily and buying stocks on margin. And he was so leveraged up that when the crash came, he was wiped out. He, had to, he was a professor at Yale University. He had to sell his house in New Haven, move in with his sister-in-law. <laughs> And then he spent the rest of the 30s trying to figure out what happened. And lots of economists were trying to figure out what happened. And one way to think about the question is, why couldn't the boom last? Why did the Roaring Twenties come to an end? Uh, here's US real GDP. I think I showed you this one last time. But you see the boom in the 20s, the big depression. That blip after the 30s, starting around 1940, that I think is largely mismeasurement. During the Second World War, we had price controls. And if you measure nominal GDP and then apply a price deflator based on controlled prices, that is prices at which you can't actually buy things, uh, it looks like there's more real output than there is because you're not deflating it enough. You're not putting in the real price, the actual market prices. So what I want you to focus on is the boom the deviation above trend followed by the very deep crash. Uh, so modern macroeconomics is born out of the uh, attempt to explain that cycle. Now one view, and I, I like to use Paul Krugman as a kind of foil because he's not really a historian of economic thought, but he sometimes plays one on his blog. <laughs> uh, he says, look, uh, the classical, by which he means pre-Keynesian, uh, economists didn't have any explanation or any solution for the Great Depression. But fortunately, uh, Keynes, after having been suppressed for so long, comes along in the mid-1930s. Well, look, uh, there were lots of economists explaining and offering solutions. Now, to be fair to Krugman, maybe what he meant was, when he said not explanations, he meant not explanations that I like, and not solutions that I like or believe in. But there were lots of cycle theories at the time. Uh, most prominent in, in the early 30s were the Austrian economists, Mises and Hayek. Uh, and there's been a kind of revival of the debate between Hayek and Keynes as the centerpiece of this period uh, in the history of thought. There were British economists. Lionel Robbins became a follower of Hayek's. The others had kind of similar theories. They were monetary theories of what caused the boom and bust. Uh, in the US, you had Irving Fisher. And there was an important group in Sweden. Uh, one aspect or one uh, piece of evidence of this revival of Hayek versus Keynes, some of you may have seen these uh, videos where Hayek and Keynes have a rap battle over what's causing the boom and the bust. Uh, if you haven't seen them, I, I recommend them. They're quite entertaining. Uh, and on the same website, you can find little videos of me trying to explain exactly what uh, Hayek was saying, because obviously they condense it a lot to fit it into short rhymes. Uh, these videos have something like 3 million hits. My little explanation video has something like 3,000 hits, but <laughs> it's getting close. Um, and uh, 
the book that uh, Stephen held up a minute ago, I, you should think of as the sort of essential compendium to understanding these videos in their real depth. And I say that because three million people have watched the videos. So if everybody who watched them would buy the book, then I could retire. Now, one thing that's brought this back into prominence, uh, brought the Hayekian alternative to uh, Keynesian theory back into prominence, is the fact that the cycle we went through was pretty clearly a boom, an unsustainable boom, followed by a bust. And that was Hayek's story of the 20s followed by the 30s. Uh, and it looks like that happened again. So here's final sales of domestic product, which is pretty nearly nominal GDP. It just makes some adjustments for uh, imports and exports. But you can see pretty much hugging the uh, trend line until around 2003 or 2002. Uh, there's a movement above the trend. Uh, sorry, it's not a clearer picture, but I took it from a PDF of a, from a diagram in a paper I wrote. Uh, and then, of course, crashing back in uh, 2008 and going below in 2009. And we've been below for, ever since then. Right? But it looks like a boom followed by a bust again. And that's what's made people interested in Hayek's uh, account again. Now, uh, you don't need to memorize this, but uh, <laughs> just to give you an idea of the different schools of thought that uh, are clashing in the debate over business cycle theory. Uh, there's a sort of four major traditions. I, I just, uh, somebody emailed me a link yesterday to a piece in which an economist at Cambridge identifies nine different traditions. So this is the simplified version. Uh, those that focus on the interest rate and the mismatch between savings and investment as a problem, uh, that's a f uh, associated with the Swedish economist Nut Vixell from around 1900. And from Vixell come the, the Swedish economists I mentioned, uh, the Austrian economists Mises and Hayek, uh, and they have their modern followers. Uh, and the early Cambridge School is represented by John Maynard Keynes's treatise on money of 1930. But Keynes changes his explanation quite a bit in the course of uh, the 30s. For one thing, Hayek writes a critical book review of the treatise and kind of smashes it to pieces. And Keynes says, OK, back to the drawing board, and comes up with a general theory. But I've made it a dotted line between the treatise and the general theory because he changes his views quite a bit. In particular, he brings in the second tradition, what I'm calling the underconsumption tradition, the idea that the problem of the Depression is not enough spending. Uh, and the earlier versions of it associated with Hobson had to do with uh, and it kind of brings us back to Piketty. Uh, people at the top of the income distribution, the, the capitalists, earning great amounts of wealth, not spending enough of it, just sitting on it. And therefore, there isn't enough demand to take all the product that's been produced off the market. That's kind of the gist of the underconsumption theory. And Keynes explicitly embraces that view, embraces even some 18th century proponents of that view people who were debating over what they called the general glut problem, uh, Thomas Malthus being the most famous. Malthus, today, more famous for his population theory. But he also had this theory of depression that the capitalists or the landlords weren't spending enough of their income. There's the quantity theory associated with Fisher, where the emphasis is on supply and demand for money. And that's a precursor to monetarism, which I'll come back to in a minute, uh, associated with Milton Friedman. And then the fourth school, and I have it in parentheses because it was never considered a business cycle theory until recently. Uh, we have general equilibrium theory. It's traditionally been thought of as a microeconomic sort of modeling framework where you uh, assume everybody's optimizing and markets are clearing. And markets are, and it demonstrates that there's a consistent set of prices that will allow that to happen, everybody to be optimizing and every market to be clearing. Uh, but it's been turned into a kind of modeling framework for business cycle theory by new classical economists who come in different varieties according to how much emphasis is placed on monetary shocks, how much is placed on real shocks, uh, and how much stickiness is attributed to economic adjustments. Uh, 
Uh, so Krugman represents a kind of modern uh, version of Keynes's uh, general theory. Uh, there are new Keynesians who are partly influenced by the general theory and partly influenced by monetarism. So they take it as a constraint that we need to have a theory that's consistent with the basic truths of the quantity theory. I'll talk about the quantity theory in my next lecture. Um, and then new classical economists who are not uh, necessarily happy with stickiness. The, the new Keynesians want to put, that is, failure of prices to adjust promptly uh, and wages to adjust promptly. New Keynesians try to explain why that should be the case. Uh, the real business cycle people like Ed Prescott, RBC is real business cycle, want to take the extreme position that monetary policy doesn't matter at all. What's happening is real shocks. They've been a little hard pressed to explain the recent recession, right? So, because that position says the financial crisis had nothing to do with it, because the financial crisis is just financial. Uh, and so their explanation for the recession has been, well, bad stuff happened. And that's about all we can say about it. Uh, there's a recent book by uh, Taylor Goodspeed, which I could have cribbed much of this from. Uh, and Goodspeed is one of the people who's been reviving the Hayek versus Keynes <coughs> angle and saying his take on it is that Hayek and Keynes weren't all that different compared to their differences with the real business cycle people. And OK, there's some truth to that, because both Hayek and Keynes thought that monetary policy mattered. Uh, there's also a recent book by uh, Nicholas Wapshot called Keynes Hayek, The Debate That Defined Modern Economics. So there's been lots of interest in that. Uh, sort of bringing back some of the traditions that have been lost to try to explain this peculiar uh, boom and bust cycle. Um, 